This is BMI Redefined with Jin and Mo. Hey everyone, welcome to BMI Redefined with Jen and Mo. Hey! Yay. All right, we are so excited to be here today to talk with an author named Kevin DeRosier. And he is an author, speaker, and coach living here in the St. Louis area. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. Great. Well, we're going to be asking you a few questions about some of your projects you've been working on, your book you're writing, and some of your speaking and coaching that you do as well. Okay. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, let's get started. So this book that I mentioned a couple of times already, tell us a little bit about how you started this book project and what you're expecting readers to get out of it. Well, the book title is Bridge Over Adversity, True Stories About Overcoming Personal Challenges. And this was inspired by my dad. My dad grew up in Rhode Island and he was he only spoke French until he was in high school. His parents immigrated from right around Montreal and he spoke French all his life and he dropped out of high school. He struggled with school, didn't like school. And that's what kids did then. Went into the service met my mom, they married, had my sister and myself. When they got out, my dad got out of the service, they moved back to St. Louis, my dad finally realized that, you know what? I can't make a good life for my family unless I better myself. So my dad went and got his GED. Then right before the GI Bill expired, he went to college to get his electrical engineering degree under the GI Bill. My sister and I, we didn't see him for almost four years because at night he was going to school, then during the day he was working to support the family. Mm -hmm. When he needed classes during the day, he would go to school during the day, he would work at night. And my sister and I were asleep by the time he got home from either school or work. And we were just getting up to go to school when he was already gone for work or leaving for work or school. So we really didn't see him, but he sacrificed and he broke that chain of poverty in our family. Mm -hmm. And I just really admire him for that. And my mom, her role in that too, all the things she had to do so my dad could get that education and better our family. My mom had to pull up her bootstraps as well and do a lot for my sister and myself, take care of things around the house. So it's an old saying, but she was the glue that held the family together. And I just really appreciated that. So that is what the basis of the book was. I came up with this idea back right around 2000 that I wanted to do this. It's also somewhat inspired by my first father-in-law I did get divorced back in 2009, but my first father-in-law, he was born in the United States, but the only reason he was born in the United States is his mom was across the border picking crops in Arizona. Mm. He was a U.S. citizen, met his wife, they had nine children, but he made sure every single one of them learned English. They got their education, made sure that they had the opportunities in life that he didn't have. So a parallel path to my parents, because my parents did the same for my sister and myself. They, I don't want to say forced, but they did. They forced <laughs> us to get that good education. And when I wasn't getting good grades, they would come down on me because I wasn't trying as hard as I should. They made sure I tried. And they really instilled that work ethic in me. So the two parallel paths made me think, I need to do something like this. Mm -hmm. But I always had an excuse. I was working full time and I didn't have time to write the book. I kept putting it off, putting it off. And I told a friend of mine about it, Kim DeMott, and Kim said, you really need to write this. Kim has a holiday party every year. I, w I go to his house every year. How's the book coming, Kevin? And he knew darn well I hadn't started it. <laughs> So after 14 or 15 years of having to bury my head when I showed up at his party, I had finally started the book. And as soon as he asked me, I said, Kim, you're not going to believe it, but I started the book. It didn't feel great saying that, uh, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a weight yeah. off my shoulders yeah. because I had been carrying around this burden for so long. Mm -hmm. And I was finally able to tell Kim that I was working on this book. And that was back in 2019. Wow. And then I started working on the book. I emailed a bunch of friends and I said, I am looking for people that have overcome severe adversity in their lives. Do you know of anybody, somebody possibly with an addiction that was homeless? And I listed various things. My friends are amazing. They came back and gave me 
the names of all kinds of people. And I called and interviewed them. And when I started interviewing them to hear their stories, I, I, wow, I didn't have it bad at all when I was a kid, neither did my parents, because the adversity that these people went through is amazing. Mm -hmm. In my book, I have 12 people that I interviewed. Each person has a chapter devoted to them. I have a woman that was trafficked and escaped being trafficked. Mm. Somebody that overdosed on drugs, was in a coma, almost died. Somebody that went to prison for a drug deal gone bad. Another person that was abused by not only her first stepmother, but her second stepmother. Mm. And the mm. list goes on and on. And somebody you guys are very close to. I was somebody, just going to say. There is somebody in my book that right? was in a head-on collision. The doctors told her she would never walk again. Not no. only is she walking, she's physically fit. She's a fitness instructor. I know, right? Uh, who could that be? I <laughs> don't know. Jenny Frey. <laughs> I know, and she, 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 she definitely talks a lot, so <laughs> she's fine. Yeah, I came out of the coma, didn't She I? came out of the coma. Yeah. She I did. feel blessed to have been part of this project. That is so awesome. And after how many surgeries? And a dozen. Yeah. yeah. A dozen. I, I look at this and I, no matter how bad somebody thinks they have it, you realize somebody had it worse than you. Right. And Ginny definitely had it worse than me, as did everyone in my book. Mm -hmm. Even though I looked at my problems as huge because we were poor growing up and we had issues. Right. We all look at our problems and think, oh, this is the end of the world. But there is always somebody that has it worse than Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Their adversities in life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, I can't wait to get the book. So when does it come out and where would we find it? It will come out hopefully in October. It's on track to come out in October. Okay. My book designer just sent the first copy that they make back to me for review. I have to review that. And after we go through a round or two of making sure everything looks good in book format, it will get proofread. Even though it's been edited twice, right. you proofread it at the end. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a process to do yeah. right. And we should be on track to get the book out in October. It'll be on Amazon. Okay. It'll be listed on my website. And I will be going through Ingram Spark, although I don't think normal people can buy through Ingram Spark. That mm -hmm. is the arm that sells to bookstores and to yeah, libraries. Yeah, the wholesalers. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm going to see if I can get it listed there as well, which mm -hmm. I should be able to. And once again, you can get it on my website or on Amazon. And what's your website again? My website is www dot bridge over adversity dot com. Okay. www dot bridge over adversity dot com. Mm -hmm. nice. That's easy. Yeah. It's easy yeah. to remember. Yeah. And the yeah. artwork, the, the, the picture. Yes. Tell us about that. that. Is gorgeous. Well thank you. That that is a bridge that's up in Iowa. It is the High Trestle Trail Bridge. I used to go up to Iowa on business and that's my picture. I took that picture. Oh wow. They told me about it. They knew I was an avid photographer. Now, th this bridge is an old train track that was converted to a walking and biking trail. But it's a mile from the nearest road. But they told me about it. So I brought my camera one trip, got on my bike, my backpack, went there to take pictures of it. And the skies were just beautiful because it was getting ready to rain. Got out my camera, lined up my tripod, started taking pictures. And as soon as I started snapping, the skies just opened up and poured all over me. I was drenched, but I got my camera in my camera bag, got back on my bike, rode my bike a mile back to my car. I was absolutely drenched. Thank God my camera gear was safe. Went back to the hotel and dried off, but I got the picture. That was, was, all, was important. And the colors the that I got in that picture were just fabulous, simply because it was going to rain. If it wasn't going to rain, I wouldn't have such a good picture. So I paid a price. Yeah. But I also was rewarded for paying yeah. that price. Yeah, it was, it, I mean, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's a fantastic picture. Yeah. Thank you. So you have also, um, you know, come, overcome adversity in your life with, you know, uh, growing up mm -hmm. and your parents and what they showed you as a child. And, but then you also lost a significant amount of weight. Yes, so can you talk about that? Because I, that really interests me. I'd love to. And yeah. that is part of the reason I waited so long to write the book is I didn't have that credibility marker. And I overcame my adversity by losing 100 pounds. What happened was I was a month from retirement. I retired early and it was March 17th, 2018. I was less than a month from retiring. 
I hadn't weighed myself in a long time. And I thought, well, maybe I weigh about 250 pounds or so. I need to do something about it. I finally got on the scale. I know it was a Saturday morning. I remember that. I looked down 288.6 pounds. And that scared the bejesus out of me. Mm-hmm. That is a lot of weight. I didn't want to get to 300 pounds. And I don't know about you, but I have seen so many people retire. And a month or two later, I'm attending their funeral because they were sick or they didn't take care of themselves or work was their entire life. I didn't want to be that person. No. So I immediately started with a boot camp. I went to a boot camp. I started going and exercising three or four mornings a week. And it worked pretty well. I, I was getting in better shape. Mm-hmm. I lost 30 pounds within a few months and was feeling really good. However, I hit that brick wall. When I got to 250, 255, I couldn't lose any more weight, no matter what I tried. And I finally said, you know what? I need to get help. I hired a weight loss coach. And I, I'm not ashamed to admit it because I couldn't do it myself. And I did. I hired an expensive weight loss coach. <laughs> but you know what? I'm worth it. And yeah. my health is worth it. I don't know how many years I've put back in my life. And he got me on a plan. So he called me in and he said, okay, we need to set a goal for you. What do you want to get down to? I said, you know, I felt pretty good about 230 pounds. How about 230 pounds? He said, lower. I said, <laughs> okay. Let's see. The first time I got married... In 2008, I was, or I'm sorry, in 1988, (laughs) I was 208 pounds. Nope, you're going lower. What? I said, you know what? I'm tired of playing this game. Why don't you just tell me what you want me to get down to? He said, you're going to get down to 199 pounds. Okay, done. Wow. He put me on a program, and it's just healthy eating, Mm -hmm. exercise, and mindset. And that was what I was missing, was the mindset. I did not have the mental capacity to lose weight because I ate to celebrate things. I ate when I was sad. And when you sit down and watch TV, how many people just grab that snack and automatically eat? They don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And he taught me that mental aspect that I was missing. And the weight started to come off. When I got down about 235 pounds, I spoke in front of a group of Toastmasters and I told them about my weight loss journey. Now I was accountable to over 100 people Mm -hmm. that... I don't know about you, but I'm competitive and I didn't want to have to face these people again that I see all the time and say, I didn't lose that weight. So I kept yep. going, going, going. And I got down to 190 pounds, 99 pounds. When I got there, I said, you know, I am so close to losing 100 pounds, only 11 more pounds. Why don't we go for... Wow. And, Good. you know, as proud as I am of that, I am more proud that I've kept it off because mm-hmm. I've lost hundreds of pounds throughout my life, oh, yeah. but I always refine them again. Yeah. They just always seem to come back and I have gained those habits. And before I lost the weight, my wife was nudging me at nights and Kevin, Kevin, you okay? Because I was gasping for breath. Mm-hmm. I would have acid reflux so bad that I would sit up in the middle of the night because of the acid reflux, go take some Maalox And I'd have to sit up for half an hour to let my throat stop burning. My Mm -hmm. feet and knees were sore and tired every Mm -hmm. single night. Mm -hmm. I was on blood pressure medication. I was taking niacin to keep my cholesterol in control. But guess what? I am on no prescription medicines whatsoever now. I take a multivitamin, but I don't have to take any medications. It's just a matter of eating properly, exercising properly, Mm -hmm. and keeping that mental mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, I did... Gain about nine or 10 pounds when I, I just went on a three and a half week vacation. I enjoyed life, but it's all coming back because when I got back, I got back to what I know how to do and what I was doing. I went to Acadia National Park. I'm an avid nature photographer, just took all kinds of pictures and they have seafood like you wouldn't believe. Being in St. Louis, it's hard to find yeah, know, good right? seafood. Yeah, yeah. So when you're there, you have to eat it. And the drawn butter on the lobster and the various things weren't the best for me. But mm-hmm. I had a good time. And I know that I can enjoy, but I know that I have the ability to get back to where I right. need to be. And I'm back to where I need to be. That's awesome. 
That's well, right. and that's the cornerstone that we've talked about a lot on BMI Redefined is the mindset piece mm -hmm. to all this. You know, mm -hmm. knowing that how to get to the, the goal or what you're reaching for, but then when you do allow yourself some leeway and, and activities and and treats or not depriving yourself from during certain experiences, then getting back into that mindset, just like you were talking about. Well, Mo, you have experience with that too. Well, right. And I, so what, I'm, what I would like to know is um, when you are, when you're preparing your meals, mm -hmm. do you prepare them for the week? Do you just go day by day? Do you have a certain amount of calories you stick with? Do you just eat anything you want except in proportion, how do you approach it? I... Or does it vary? It, I don't think it varies, but I have found that cooking my own meals is so much better than eating out. And that's what I had to do for three and a half weeks when I was on vacation is eat out. And they add all this butter, all I this know, salt. And the salt, right? The, the sodium is sky high. Sky high. Even I know. the prepared foods you buy. If you buy the prepared foods that you just throw in the microwave or in the oven from the store, right. these nice convenient meals, you look at the sodium, 600 milligrams of sodium in a serving. And tomato soup, I just saw it the other day. A can of tomato soup, Campbell's, like the the regular one, 480, I don't know, grams or milligrams of sodium. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Yeah, so what I do is I shop on Monday mornings because I don't like shopping on the weekends with other people <laughs> and I'm retired and I can do that. Yeah. Smart, smart, <laughs> like, yeah. And I plan the menu for the week. So usually there's a lean meat, a chicken or a pork. Mm -hmm. There's some sort of fish. I'll occasionally throw in some beef. I, I mm -hmm. really enjoy a good steak now and then. And I will plan out my vegetables and I have vegetables with every meal. I, I never used to eat vegetables, I eat them now. I will make enough, well, let's say I make chicken tonight. I'm going to make enough chicken for a few days, mm -hmm. and then we'll eat that for a day or two, and then I'll make the fish, and we have enough of that for a couple of days, and we'll get back to the chicken, and we'll kind of rotate, and we might do something else at the end mm -hmm. of the week. But I do plan the meal for the week. I don't make everything like some people do on a one day right. and then reheat right. it, right. but I, I make a large enough serving that I've got several meals out of that. Great. And That's that, Breakfast is pretty much the same thing. I, I use leftover vegetables in my eggs in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'll chop them up, put it in. I saute. It, usually I have broccoli or asparagus, cauliflower, things like that right. at night. And there's always a little bit left over. I'll chop those up and mm -hmm. put them in the skillet along with some shallots, some mushrooms, a lot of garlic. I love garlic. Yeah, good. And I good. scramble a few eggs in with that. Or I'll have a protein shake in the morning, strawberry protein shake. Mm -hmm. It just varies that if I am really in a hurry, I might have some Kashi cereal. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Which is probably, for me, one of the better cereals out there as far as nutrition. But yeah. I do that, but I eat six times a day as well instead of right. having all those big meals. So I'll have my breakfast in the morning, mm -hmm. a mid-morning snack. I'll, I'll have an apple, a pear, an orange, wow. banana, whatever. Might have a handful of almonds if I'm mm -hmm. on the road or something like that and don't have time to do that. Have a lunch, some sort of wrap or a salad, mm -hmm. usually a lean meat, a turkey or a chicken. Mm -hmm. In the afternoon, I'll have a mid-afternoon snack. It could be a cup of yogurt, it could be some more almonds, it could be another piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. Then my dinner, and at night I always have a dessert. I have a good dessert, and I found a good array of desserts that aren't overloaded with sugar, but mm -hmm. I satisfy that sweet craving. Good. So I'm eating six times a day, and my stomach is always full. Yeah. I'm on the treadmill a few times a week, and I do a little bit of resistance training. Yeah. Good. That keeps me in shape. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And you feel so much better, right? Oh, it, it's amazing. I have energy. I'm not getting tired. My feet and knees aren't sore every night. And I'm mm -hmm. hoping I've put off having to get knee or hip replacement surgery as Wonderful. I get older because I see so many people do that that yeah. lays them up for so long. And I don't want to be that person. In right. that. If I can do something to circumvent that, I'm going to do everything I can. Right. I only have one body. Right. That's right. It's better to be preventive, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. good, good. Okay. So, we've talked about a number of different topics already, and you mentioned earlier that you are a speaker and a coach. So, what types of topics do you speak and coach on? Okay. I, I have two topics I speak about right now. Okay. The first is I will speak about the book, Overcoming Adversity. I, okay. I will be working with organizations that 
try to help people overcome their adversity. They want to see their members, their people, be the best they can be and overcome the adversity in their life. So they're better people, better employees even. And I want to inspire them so they can get better. So I will speak to organizations about that. And I will take a combination of the stories from my book. I, I have 12 different stories. And if I'm talking with a group that works with people that have addictions, I will tell an addiction story or two. Or a group that works with homeless people, I'll talk about the homeless person. And I'll filter in those stories that will have some meaning to them. And by the end of that story, hopefully they will say, you know what, I can overcome my problems in life too. That's what I want to do with that topic. The other topic I talk about, because I've been in Toastmasters for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I'm a distinguished Toastmaster two times over. And distinguished mm -hmm. Toastmaster, for those of you that don't know, is the highest individual award you get in Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. You have to give 50 or 60 speeches to become a distinguished Toastmaster, exhibit some leadership qualities, serve as a district officer, and do several things. But it's a long, arduous process. Only about 2% of all Toastmasters become distinguished Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. And I've been speaking in front of crowds for a long time. I used to speak at conferences when I worked at Anheuser-Busch and then again in my second job, I oversaw people that maintain equipment in the Anheuser-Busch breweries. And one year they had a maintenance conference in Daytona in December and I said, you know what? It's cold in St. Louis in the winter. I'm going to apply to speak there and if they pay my way, which they do for conferences like that, I can get a vacation, get out of the cold. Yeah. Well, they accepted me as a speaker. I went down there and spoke. I was rated their top speaker that year. Then other organizations started approaching me. Ken, would you speak at our conference? Would you speak at this? So I got asked to speak in Australia. I spoke in both Perth and Melbourne. I spoke in South Africa, several cities across the United States. Mm -hmm. And my boss let me go to these and said, you know what? It's work related because it's what you do. Didn't charge me a vacation time. Oh, good. Yeah, it was like a vacation. <laughs> I wasn't going to work and I was having a good time. Yeah. But I did take some vacation time at the end of it and do some things because half the battle's getting overseas and getting right. to those places or getting to some of these cities. So I really got a lot of practice speaking in front of people and I love that. So the other thing I speak about is public speaking. I teach public speaking. I do a lot of teaching for Toastmasters mm -hmm. and I, I work with not only organizations but individuals and I coach them on how to become a better speaker, how to grab your audience's attention right. and how to get that call to action at the end so they mm -hmm. are engaged when you're talking and if, especially if you're trying to sell something, mm -hmm. how can I sell my idea or sell my product to them? That's what I work with and I work with quite a few people doing that and it's it's a great skill to have communication when i was trying to hire people some of the people i tried to hire when i was working they could not communicate either written or verbally and it, it is painful it's a, it's becoming a lost art so if you can learn that skill if you can communicate you can get ahead in life really quick right so that is something i like to teach and i work like i said with organizations and small groups or with individuals okay Oh, that's fantastic because the, the art of communication, you know, it, it's kind of morphed through the years now that we have all the technology and the, and the texting and the, 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 the shortness or, or abruptness of conversations and messages. And like some people would rather email or text than pick up the phone or stop by somebody's office. And so having that art of communication and being able to present is just, yeah, it's imperative. It really is. But also one of the biggest fears people have is public speaking. According to, I think it's the book of lists, that infamous book of lists you hear about, people would rather die than speak in public. Um, I mean, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so how, you know, when you, when you talk with somebody, just, I guess, coaching them through that, that first step, I guess finding what they're passionate about or what their message is going to be is probably the first thing to identify. Exactly. Too many people if they have to give a speech for an organization or a presentation for an organization, they say, what's a topic that they'll really like? They don't pick something they're passionate about. And then that shows because they have a hard time getting enthusiastic about it themselves. If you're talking about something you're enthusiastic about, you're passionate about, you can see it in the person's eyes. You can hear it in their voice. And now I want to listen to you. Mm -hmm. Now, I know it's hard in work presentations, but there are certain tricks for work presentations too, where you have to present some boring data on how to get that across, mm -hmm. how to engage the audience and make them want to hear what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. there, there are 
tips and tricks that you can do for just about any kind of speaking. But if you're just talking about something, that's why I only speak about public speaking and overcoming adversity. I, I love so many other things in life, but I don't want to talk about the things that, that I'm not as passionate about. People will see it, and I want them, when I speak, to say, wow, he really cares about that. I think I need to listen to this and understand why mm -hmm. he is so mm -hmm. passionate mm -hmm. about that. Right. And that, that's one of the big things. And the other is an opening. When you first start mm -hmm. talking, if you don't grab somebody's attention in the first 30 seconds, you've probably lost them. That's when they decide if they want to listen to you or not. You have to have that hook to get them interested, get them engaged. Yeah. That's the first thing I will teach somebody. If you want people to listen, you need to have that hook. Mm -hmm. Now, nervousness, it doesn't go away overnight. I will work with people for quite some time. They have to keep practicing and practicing. But as they get confident and know, you know what, I've got that hook in there. I have a good solid body to my presentation. I wrap it up well at the end. They're going to start feeling less nervous and have confidence simply because they're more confident in their material. So if you're confident mm -hmm. in ma your material, that translates into confidence in how you present that material as well. But it also takes practice. You just can't say, I'm confident in my material, but not practice delivering and have those delivery <laughs> skills. Pretty much. Uh, often delivery is yes. key. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> that's and true. your audience can't see that, but I've been talking with my hands the whole time because right, right. body language is important. Yeah. People learn three different ways. They learn by listening slash reading. Mm -hmm. They learn by seeing and they learn by doing. When you're right. speaking, you can easily engage people in two ways. Mm -hmm. And that is by your speaking as well as by showing them with your body language, mm -hmm. be demonstrative. Mm -hmm. Right, right. A really good speaker finds a way to incorporate that third aspect for the type of learner that has to do and have them interacting and doing some things as well. So you want to attack all three of those. And that's just kind of a snippet of some of the things I teach people when I coach. I might be interested in that. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we should come take one of your classes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What I wanted to ask you is uh, just one more question. How would people benefit from reading from your book? Okay, so my, my target audience is twofold. One, obviously, I would like people that are facing adversity to read the book and find a story in there that they can identify with and say, you know what, this person did it and here's how they did it. Here are the steps they took. I can do that as well. But realistically, a lot of people that have those problems are not going to pick up a book and read it. Some will but a lot won't. So it's also targeted for the loved ones of people with adversity or challenges in their life. Mm -hmm. A parent, a friend, a spouse, a child or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they can read it and they can understand, here is what I can do to help this person. So it's kind of a two-pronged approach. It's mm -hmm. aimed at people that have adversity in their lives, but also the people that care about their friends that have adversity in life or family members that have adversity in life so they can find a way to help them because we all need help to get better in life. We can't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. But that's who would benefit from this book. And you benefit by reading the stories. Not necessarily all of them. You can cherry pick and pick and choose the stories you want. But I think every story has a slightly different angle that is taken and you can learn something from reading all of them. Mm -hmm. But at the end, it's key that you read the five characteristics they had that kept them in that controversy, why they couldn't escape, the things they did, such as they refused help when people offered them help. Every single one of them at some point had somebody <laughs> reaching out their hand saying, I'd love to help you. And they knew better. They said, I don't need your help. I can do it myself. Mm -hmm. Going to the 11 characteristics they had in common, and that's something that you can learn how to do and these are the things I can do to get out of this. And one of those is invest in yourself. Learn something new and take the time to take care of yourself, not just those around you. Because we're all good at taking care of our friends. We, we take care of people, we neglect ourselves so many times. Right. And that's one of the 11 characteristics they had mm -hmm. is they have to learn how to take care of themselves. And once they started caring about themselves and doing things to help themselves is when they started to turn their lives around. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for both. I'm not really sure if there's an audience it's not for, but there are some people, people that 
have a great life and they have a great attitude, they may not get as much out of it. Mm -hmm. But I am narrowing it down to people that are having challenges in their lives and people that want to help them. That's great. That's great. That's when great. I think there's kind of a message that you're sharing too about when you're going through a challenge, kind of figuring out what you can do with that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like how you can help yourself, how you can help others along the way, maybe having a similar journey. Now, you mentioned helping others. And when I went into this book, I knew I was going to look for the characteristics. I tried to go in with no preconceived notions of what characteristics would help, would help them escape. I had a few in mind regardless, but there's one that came up that just totally blindsided me. Every single person that I interviewed and that escaped their adversity and are happy now, they're giving back to society in some way. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't looking for that. I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. But that is something every single one of them does. And a lot of them do it around the challenges they had in life. There, there was a woman that had congenital heart disease, and she works with people that have medical issues. Mm -hmm. The person that had the drug overdose, they talk to people that have problems with drugs, and they work with them. The woman that was abused, she's helping women that were abused and have problems in their life. So every one of them is turning back. Ginny is working with people, fitness. She's training mm -hmm. people. But every single one of them is giving back, and that is so key. And that's the key to their happiness. And I was really happy to see that. But I wasn't thinking about it at all. I learned a lot from the book myself. That's great. Yeah, that's neat. So as we're kind of wrapping up here, it's been fantastic talking with you today, yes. Kevin. This has been great. I know our listeners are getting a lot out of it and they're going to enjoy your book. What are just some final messages or words of wisdom you'd like to share with our listeners? I, I just want to tell people, no matter how bad you have it, there are people that have it worse and there are people out there willing to help you. Don't turn down that help. And I will throw one surprise at you that I just found out about two weeks ago. Hopefully in October, not only will one book come out, but I will have two books. Oh, what? Good. Okay, do tell. Yeah. The second book is a companion book to Bridge Over Diversity, True Stories About Overcoming Personal Challenges. I am really big on inspirational messages. I love reading inspirational quotes and right. seeing those things. Yeah. And I know it's only Facebook, but I see a lot of them on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. But I've actually bought the books and right. read those inspirational quotes. And I thought, you know what? I've got 11 characteristics. I am going to find inspirational quotes for each of those characteristics that help them escape. So I have 11 chapters with 31 quotes each. So you can read one a day for a month, no matter how many days are in that month. If it's got 28 right. days in a month, you've got a bonus of three extra quotes. <laughs> I love and it. then I added a 12th chapter, my favorite inspirational quotes, the things that mean the most to me. So mm -hmm. along with that book, if you need some motivation, some inspiration, I will be coming out with a quote book that will help inspire you. And when you look at those different challenges, and ways to overcome those challenges, you'll have some things you can read that help get you going and get you moving in the right direction. That's great. <laughs> that is awesome. Now, I'm just going to ask because I just want to know. Okay. So did you like just fall into coaching or was this something planned in your life? Well, when I was a child, <laughs> yes. I wanted to be a teacher ah, at first. Oh, okay. But then I saw... God, teachers don't make a lot of money. <laughs> no, nope. I'm not going to say it. I'm, I'm a little mater materialistic. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but then I wanted to be a radio broadcaster. Mm. And my idol was Jim White at KMOX in St. Louis. He was a talk show host back before talk, show ho talk shows were controversial. Mm -hmm. He would have an open line every night. And people would just call and talk about whatever they wanted to. Mm. And when I was in high school, I was going to become a radio broadcaster. My junior year on spring break... I went down to see him, sat in on a show. My mom came with me and he said, you know, let me explain something to you. This isn't as glamorous as it seems. Only a small percentage make it like I did. You're going to start in some podunk town as the janitor, the engineer, the broadcaster. Right. You're going to lock the doors and you're going to do all this stuff. And I walked out of there and said, 
but I'm not going to do this either. I'm going to become an electrical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, I went from an inexpensive college to a very expensive engineering college. My parents had to pivot. But then I got in Toastmasters, and I started mentoring people and speaking. I, I currently mentor 14 people wow. in my various Toastmasters clubs. I'm in four clubs right now. Mm. And people continually come to me and ask me to help. I present mm. at our district's leadership institute and I teach people different aspects of speech speaking at those so I thought you know what I can do this for free and I enjoy it why not do something I enjoy and monetize it and mm -hmm. what really turned me around was back when I was working in Anheuser-Busch and I was teaching a class we flew in people from all the breweries it was maintenance business fundamentals mm -hmm. we taught people how to maintain equipment in the breweries and our vice president of operations kicked off that class every time we had it. He said, Kevin, I hear you're a Toastmaster. Can you evaluate my presentation to your class? Sure, be happy to. Wow. I wrote him a five-page evaluation. <laughs> Gave it to his secretary later that day. Didn't hear from him for about a week. <laughs> then he poked yeah. his head in my office door yeah. a couple weeks later and says, Hey, Kev, what are you doing next week? I said, well... Pete, I hope I still have a job. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a job. But can you fly on the corporate jet with me next week to our Williamsburg Brewery and evaluate my communication meetings? So I became his personal speaking coach. And when we got back, wow. he started inviting me to meetings that were well above my pay grade. And I was jotting notes for him on how he could become a better speaker. And he was a great student. He started having me do some of his direct reports. Mm. I did that. That became part of my annual review. Imagine that. An electrical engineer teaching public speaking as part of his job. <laughs> right, right. Those people don't exist. Right, right. <laughs> but then when I changed jobs in my next company, I told my boss about that. And I said, do you think your boss, who was a director, would be interested? And I said, ask him. I did. I did that for him. He had me do all of his direct reports. So I started going to their meetings and evaluating. Then they started having me do their frontline managers. And that became a large percentage of my job, mm -hmm. watching people speak and telling them how they could get better, telling them what they did well mm -hmm. and what opportunities they had to bring it to the next level and improve. So wow. when I retired, I said, you know what? I've got to do something with this other than just Toastmasters. Now I'm not working. I don't have to do it as part of my job. And even though I technically wasn't getting paid extra for it, I was getting paid because that was part of my job description at right. some point. Right. I right. thought, I'm going to do this because I really enjoy it. I love working with people. I love people in general. Yeah. And yeah. I love speaking. I'm a ham. I love being in front of an audience. <laughs> we can in see case that. you couldn't tell. <laughs> right. We can tell. If you could see his hands. If you could see his yes. hands. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm not Italian. And you're not Italian. <laughs> Today. Thank you. I had a fantastic great. time. Oh, this was good. Thank Just, you for having me. Great. I was going to, and I was going to ask you if you've ever been in radio because you have a radio voice. You do. You really do. Never so. have been in radio, but I wanted to be. I know. Well, here's your chance. Yeah. Now you <laughs> you know, talk radio has devolved into something I don't want to be a part of. I don't yeah. listen to talk radio. When I retired, yeah. I quit watching TV yeah, and I quit too. listening to talk radio. And I am so much more at peace with myself yeah. that I don't need that. And I don't want to be part of that, no. that I stir up people. No. And you, you almost have to be a shock jock to you do. be Jimmy on radio right. now or right. television. Exactly. You have to sensationalize everything. And I don't believe even that. Nah, so, no. It's even not. though that was one of my goals as a young child, it's one that I'm going to go to my grave saying, I'm glad I didn't do it. Good. Good. Well, you're much, uh, you're, you're so much better doing this, what you're doing now. Yeah. Well, so thank you're you. helping a lot of people and informing a lot of people. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, Kevin. It's been great. And thank you everyone for joining us today on BMI Redefined with Jen and Mo. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.